You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 86, Time is Everything. This week on The Dental Guys, John and I discuss, is it worth it to spend time with your patients? Does that pay off in the end with a better treatment plan, a bigger treatment plan? Or is it just better just to go in and do your check? Also, we discuss some interesting results from a most recent article discussing resonance frequency analysis. And lastly, we answer one of the best questions we've got from one of our longtime listeners about sleep apnea and what we're doing right now in our practice. It's all coming up this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by The Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Nashville in 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com now to sign up. That's RestorativeDrivenImplants.com. And welcome to this week's episode of the Dental Guys. I'm John the Dental Guy. And I'm Wes the Dental Guy. And you know it is uh, it's crazy over here, Wes. We're <laughs> we're about we're about to get it's, it's like Noah's flood of 2019. We're we're the forecast says in the next three mm. days we're supposed to get five to seven inches of rain. We've already had somewhere like five inches of rain in the last month. <clears throat> it's been constantly raining, and now they're saying that we we're gonna have like significant flooding. What do you, this won't hold the rain we're gonna get. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna it's gonna outdo your little your cute little graduated cylinder over there. And I mean, I, there is is I'm kind of joking about it, but I'm kind of worried because yeah. our little area over here in the kind of by the mountains, there's this one river that's yeah, it's called like the Nolichucky. The Nolichucky, and it's a beast. It's great, gr- it's a great river to yeah. fish on. Great river. But it can to get fish. out of control because it's not dam controlled yeah. coming out of North Carolina. Yeah, there's no flow control, no damming, so it basically just goes. And um, we had this flood probably back in 2001 or so. It was devastating for our area, and it, it mm-hmm. wiped out a ton of stuff. And it looks like if they're right, that it might get serious. And the thing that uh, that happened um, a while back uh, when the, when we had that flood. We that was the first flood that tested our new office when we built it, and um, we had uh, not apparently done a good enough job on the drainage control. Oops! And so we had water coming into the basement. We have this like part of it that's a finished basement, and it overwhelmed the sump pumps down there. And thank goodness we had like the people that put the equipment in had the foresight to elevate everything up on uh, blocks. Because we had like mm. two or three inches of water down there before the pumps finally caught up and didn't. That's not going to happen again, is it? No, it, that's the thing. After that, we like went back to the drawing board. We tore the whole back of the place up, put in a bunch of drainage pipe and everything. And it's been great ever since. But man, you're scaring me a little bit. Yeah, no, I know. I know. For some, reasons we can't discuss here. Yeah, exactly. There's some important stuff down there. You know, we're making methamphetamine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm down in the we're hole. Breaking bad. We're breaking bad down in the basement. <laughs> No, seriously, it is pretty. A, it's a pretty big deal right now because <clears throat> it, we've already had record rainfall. Twenty eighteen in East Tennessee, actually all of Tennessee was uh, record rainfall in our area, and uh, you know we are fortunate to be downstream from John, and we're yeah, protected by right. uh, by uh, dams that were built years ago by the Tennessee Valley Authority. Interesting thing is, as we were talking about this earlier, they are prepping. Uh, to bring those up to summer pool real quick because of this storm, and yeah. that's pretty amazing. That's a lot of water. It's a lot of, water, a lot of water, man. Water. It's crazy. It's gonna be. It's gonna be an event. I feel like if it ends up now. Now you were telling me before we started 
You said I got some cool bee stuff going on. What does that? Well, what does it's that mean? interesting. Here's the thing about bees. Well, everybody, that... everybody, if you don't know, Wes is like a bee. He's not just a beekeeper, but he's like a beekeeper. The nerd, the beekeeper's beekeeper. So, yeah. so tell, what's going on in your world of bees, Wes? Well, the world of bees is getting ready to get cranked up. In fact, it already is, and in a this. in a real big this. way. Um, so it's interesting how you you know do you know how the groundhog stays its shadow. Yes. Okay. Punks well, the tiny. bees are very predictive of what's going to happen. Okay. So, and recently, I was out in my hives, and <laughs> <laughs> I was out in my. I was, out, I was my uh, out perusing the hives about three weeks ago. Now we're recording this on the nineteenth of February. We're talking about at the end of January, first of February. I was out, and I it was a warm day, <clears throat> oddly warm, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go out see what we got going down, and I cracked the top of each box I've got, each hive, and I noticed that the bees had moved up into the top part of the box. Okay. So. What's that mean, Wes? What does it mean? It's a little early for that, but what that means is, is that spring is just around the corner. Oh. So when I saw that, I thought, man. I was like, how can this be? So this week, nope. the maples, the maple trees are blooming. That's true. And the bees are Some cherry are blossoms working. are out too. I saw that. Yeah, they're, they're working pollen. And you think in February, we're working pollen, the cherries. Actually, cherries produce nectar. The bees will bring that in. So the tough thing about this is, is as the rain comes, the bees don't get to get out. Okay. And so we have to feed them. And so what we do is pretty interesting. Is so you don't feed them a you feed them a sugar water, but you make it thicker. Now here's here's what's cool is if you thin the sugar water water out like nectar from a plant, mm-hmm. it will induce the queen to start laying eggs. So you'll actually huh. she'll say, oh, it's springtime, okay, and she'll actually start laying a brood pattern. So, so we make it thicker. Them. You're messing with them. It's pretty amazing stuff, you know. So uh, so the you're, so the bees were right, is what you're saying. The bees were, the bees right, were right about spring, because the, and well, the trees followed right after that. As far as I can tell, the bees were mm-hmm. right. That's awesome. And it is pretty sweet. That's pretty awesome. Cool I mean, I, I've learned a lot, and plus, I mean, I have benefited from the bees because I've gotten a, that some of that honey, man. Oh my goodness! Mm. My wife it's made amazing, these like it? honey cake things mm. using oh, them, my. using the honey. It was like this British recipe, and uh, mm. oh man. It was amazing. That sounds amazing. John, tell us a little bit about today's show and what's going to happen. Yeah, well, just uh, let's take a quick break and get a happen? word from our <laughs> word from our sponsor, and then it's going to be an exciting time because this we're going to be talking a little bit more today. We're going to talk about some clinical things. We're also going to mm. talk a little bit today about what makes a practice grow, and and is it the clinical skill of the dentist? Is it uh, or does it have something more to do with if the way that you spend time with your patients and, and how your philosophy works there. So come back uh, in just a minute after this word from our sponsor, and we'll talk more about that. This is Justin Gibber, and here is today's tip. A lot of dentists who have been in practice for some time start seeing the advantages of having another associate. But before you bring someone in, you need to make sure, number one, you have enough cash to weather any potential economic downturns, and number two, the company's new patient flow is high enough you don't have to reduce your personal production. Ramp up your marketing and bring in some new patients so that everyone stays busy. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak to a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Gibber is an investment advisor representative of Heritage Investors, a registered investment advisor. Visit heritageinvestor.com or financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, and we're back uh, after that word, and let's talk a little bit more about today's show, Wes. Uh, you know, we just a few episodes ago we talked with Amy Morgan from Spear Education, and you know, uh, Amy's a, of course a practice management a guru. Has been around a long time, and we asked the question of her because we're always talking about uh, clinical skill and what 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 does it really matter, and does it matter? Is it the thing that makes you successful? And of course, you guys know the answer. We we feel that that's 
very important. But I think that, you know, one of the things that, that we have certainly talked about a lot personally, you and I, is how much of a value is the clinical skill level in making your practice grow? You know, how much of it is really that? And I think that, that one of the questions that I want to kind of discuss with you today, Wes, is how much does it matter that you have good clinical skills if you don't spend the time with patients? And really, the better question maybe is, is, is the thing that's been, you know, responsible for your success, my practice success over the years, has it been our clinical skill mainly or has it been something different? And I think we've kind of been challenged a little bit on this by a lot of the moves or a lot of the discussion. I mean, it's a popular topic these days to talk about efficiency in a practice, mm. right? We hear this, this whole talk about how to make your practice run more efficiently, how to decrease your overhead. And, you know, there's two ways to decrease overhead. One is to decrease cost. The other is to increase production. And I think that what I want to maybe dwell on here for a little bit is, you know, what have you done in your practice, Wes, besides your continuing education or clinical education that you think has been most responsible for the growth of your practice? Because I have a feeling, just based on our discussion previous to the show, that we both kind of feel that it's this similar. Tell, tell me a little bit about that with you, and, and then let's talk a little bit about that kind of thing as far as spending time with patients and treatment planning and just time in general in the practice, how you spend it. So years ago, back when I started my practice, I had to make the decision. Actually, I didn't even have to make the decision about how I would do a new patient exam because um, I didn't really know another way other than I was going to see my new patients first. And because that's what you did in dental school. It's what we did in dental school. Yeah. It's what we did in residency. Um, and, uh, you know, new patients came through the dentist chair. And um, my exam was always an hour to an hour and a half long. And it seems that over the years, the more things that I learned, the easier it was to incorporate that into my practice because I didn't really have to go back and change how I did my new patient orientation. Um, that's what we call our new patient orient <clears throat> new patient exam is the 0150 is the new patient orientation. And it's an orientation to how we do things at our office. It's an orientation to your mouth and what's going on with your oral health. And, and so when we did that, what it did is that we, we set ourselves up for having more of a relationship-based practice versus a technical-based practice, mm -hmm. okay? So, like, when I say technical-based, I mean you're just there for a service, right. okay? So you come in, have your teeth clean, you go home. You come in, you have your teeth clean, you go home. And you, that's just, you're providing just a, a service, it's... It's easy in, easy out. Right. And, you know, I shared with you a person that I saw yesterday that even recently, okay, this patient's not been a patient for a super long time, maybe three or four years, and has always seen one of my top hygienists and my newest hygienist of six, seven months, who is almost a year out of hygiene school has begun learning things and create helping patients to become aware of maybe problems. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I bring new things to the table, okay, like new procedures, a new way of thinking about treatment, a new way of handling certain things, it's harder to interrupt the hygiene room than it is to interrupt the new patient experience from a new 0150. Right. Because what ends up happening is you end up entering into the hygiene room either right before the hygienist has started her cleaning or right at the end of the appointment. Yep. And so what you're left with is about five to 10 minutes of time to help try to 
bring that patient up to speed with what you've learned. The question is, because that's hard, that's very difficult. Yeah. And yesterday I was running 30 minutes behind and here I am with a, with a girl that has a zero cavities, has never had a filling. The only thing, and she has beautiful teeth. Like if you look at her teeth, I send them to you, John, they're beautiful. Yeah. Right. Except for some things that we now recognize as a problem. Pathway wear, edge wear, that, we're not going to get into the specifics of what we would do to treat this. It just means that we know more now than we did three years ago about what to do yeah. and what things to recognize. So the hardest thing about this is to recognize as a young dentist, okay, it's never easy to take the time, never, to take the time because you don't feel like that you're gaining anything. Right. Now, when I say gaining, what I'm meaning is, is that you never feel like you're going to monetarily gain from this conversation because what you're, what you're doing is taking 30, 40 minutes, maybe more, away. And sometimes you just have to say, you know what, I don't have time for this. And you're going to have to convince that patient to come back and have to. And that's where your team really plays a role in helping you. And that's where pitchers play a role you know, with this patient. And in particular, we took a few pictures. She recognized the problem. It took 20 minutes for me to really, and I felt like I needed to give her that time. Yeah. And guess what? She can't, she's coming back for modeling and she's coming back for, for, um, some, uh, some more comprehensive exam. It's an uphill battle always because you know, as well as I know that both you and I, John, we're always going to learn something new and we're always going to pick out things from what we've learned as like, okay, these are practice changers. Now we've got to implement it. Well, it's easy to implement the 0150s, like the new people entering into the practice. But the hygiene side, dude, that's a battle that I have all the time. And those are the hardest patients to get, to get into my 0150 room, you know, and go through the process again of the new patient orientation. Right, right. So do, does it pay off is the question, right? So as many, here's, here's, the, here's the short answer. Yes, it pays off if that's the kind of practice you want. So if you want the commodity-based practice where you're just, you're, just, you're, just, you're just checking it, man. You're just, you do the check, you get paid. You do the check, you get paid. And you don't want the relationship, okay? That's cool because that works. But the the other I feel like is a little more laid back. It's relationship based. Like I had a lady that I referred to you John cuz she's building a house. Her husband died last year. Her name's Linda. And and she and I hugged. You know, at the end of her hygiene appointment. I'm passing her on to you cuz she's building a house in Jonesboro. And you know what? I felt good about that because I've had a relationship with Linda I haven't done a lot of comprehensive dentistry. I don't think any on her, but it, her relationship, you know what she asked me about today at the end of the appointment? Hey, how's your garden? How's your bees? You know? And do you think that Linda, if I set her down and I said, Hey, you need to come back because I'm seeing some concerns and your teeth are breaking down. Do you think she's going to believe me or is she going to believe the in and out dentist, the commodity based dentist that you need a full mouth reconstruction? Right, right. See, the relationship business gets the best, best patients, John. Yeah. They get the best relationship, and they get the people, I think, in my chair that really appreciate me and having a relationship with me. That, that's that's the 10-minute yeah. answer to your complex question. Well, and I, um, and I think that, you know, <clears throat> what I like about the dental guys here is that, you know, Wes and I have totally different personality types, you know, so... Wes just gave you like the, the philosophy of it, Yeah, you know, right. and that's, and that's exactly what it is. It's relationship building, it's trust building, um, it's storytelling, you know, mm. and it's connecting to each other, uh, with stories and what we know and, and making a real connection. And, you know, kind of my personality type, <clears throat> I'm more of like, all right, so let's talk about like logistics of that. And how does that mm -hmm. actually need to look and, and how much, let's talk, you know, what's the brass tax look like for that, you know, on a daily basis and how much time do you budget and how does that work? And as your practice grows, 
how do you can you scale that up? Do you do you, what at what point do you reach capacity barriers where you can't you know see the patients like you want to? And I think that that's where <clears throat> you know it's very easy to do. It's it's I don't want to say it's easy. It's never easy, but it's easier <laughs> to do this when you're starting off and you're slow. You know because you got oh, nothing yeah. but time and you should be devoting that time to developing relationships with patients. I think what becomes difficult is when your practice starts to grow in patient numbers or you have a larger practice of multiple doctors or you buy a practice that's already very busy that's doing things completely different than what you are. Or maybe you've built a practice over the years that you start to feel those, you know, those reimbursements keep dropping you know, mm -hmm. and uh, for your periodic exams and your two surface composites and your single crowns and you're going, you know, I don't know, like, I'm not really liking this. I feel like I'm working harder and making yeah, let, less money. I think that, that that you made a valid point there and I want you to go on because I want to hear the John Rogers technical side of this is that I don't think, John, that you can be a relationship dentist and be a commodity based dentist at the same time. I think the two conflict mm -hmm. um, because a commodity based dentist, if, if that's even a term, I just talking out, you know, talking out loud here is someone that's just, again, you're just providing a service. You're in and out. It's the 30 minute profi. It's the quick exam. You don't have any cavities. You're out the door. Right. That does not line up with what we're talking about. I don't think it does. I don't right. think it works. Yeah. Go I ahead. think, I think you can, um, I think you can have to some extent a combination of, um, you know, you have certain patients in your practice that they dictate that they sure. will be a commodity based or a, you know, insurance, but as, as Spear would say below the insurance line, you know, type of patient where they only want what insurance pays for and they, no matter what, they don't really care to hear about comprehensive dentistry right now, or they're not interested and they really don't even want to see the doctor. They just want to get out of there. They really do just mm -hmm. want to get their teeth clean. Those patients will always be there. The question is whether that is something that you are actively trying to change or whether you are allowing that to change you. And Ooh. I think that that is what I, I want to talk about here is you know, if you're in a practice that you are feeling like you are just working for the insurance company, what mm. is going to happen? I will tell you right now, if you don't actively fight that, it will take you down. And I, I don't mean it'll take you down like you can't be successful, but you're going to end up in the next 10 to 15 years for sure making less money than you probably are right now, unless you are a very, very good business person. Um, and you're going to be working harder than you are now, and you're probably not going to be doing the kind of dentistry that you really wish that you could do. And certainly if you're going and taking more comprehensive treatment planning type of uh, education, you're going to be disappointed because you're not going to have time to really implement that. So you have to decide if you're going to fight that, and it is an uphill battle, as Wes said, it's a constant constant battle. And I think that the thing is, is, you know, if you are getting busier, as you are getting into where you're doing more dentistry, the question is, are you doing the dentistry that you want to be doing? That's the first thing. And if you are great, then stop listening to this, I guess, you know, <clears throat> but I think all of us want to be doing more of the dentistry that we love. And I think that the way that I used to think that I would be able to do more of the dentistry that I love to just be able to get better at dentistry. And I think that's still absolutely true. You have to be able to do the clinical dentistry and that will always be the case that the clinical skill matters. But I think more and more as I look back over the last 10 years or more, and I think about why I'm, I'm producing more, why the practice is growing, why I can set goals and, and be able to meet those goals. It has a lot more to do with that, that, that day to day investment of time. And, you know, I, I don't use, I'm not usually the story guy, but I'll tell you the story about what happened today to me just very quickly. I had a new patient come in, um, ended up that new patient and we rarely do this, but that new patient need her, his wife was getting a cleaning done at the same time he came in as a new patient. So he saw a hygienist at the same time she was getting her teeth clean. And this gentleman, uh, has ground his teeth for 60 some years. He says he grinds his teeth all through the day. 
and through the night. And the short story is, I went in there, he had broken several teeth, he's severely worn down, uh, needs a full mouth reconstruction, um, and somebody had just done single tooth dentistry and basically was just, it was getting worse and worse, he was breaking more and more things. And it turned out that uh, the man had cerebral palsy and no one had ever just told him that patients with cerebral palsy have a high chance of being Bruxers because they have involuntary muscle movement, you know, and, and, and he, and I just sat and talked with he and his wife for probably 15, 20 minutes about medical history and medications and Bruxism and cerebral palsy and why he was doing this, you know? And yeah, like you say, I was already, I was running behind. I had uh, six composites in a room. The patient was numb sitting there, you know, and that's stressful. But the man just turned to me and he just says, no one's ever told me that this wasn't really my fault. Like that there was a reason for this, you know, because I always thought, man, I just have to stop grinding. I have to stop grinding. And I just couldn't. And I grind my teeth all day long. And he, he ended up shaking my hand yeah. and just saying, thank you for, and he looked over at his wife. He's like, why all these, he's like, we've gone to so many different dentists trying to figure out a problem. They were from another state and no one's ever just told me that, that this and told me that there's a, there's a way to, to, to fix this. And my, my hygienist knows when, they, when this patient comes in the room, they know that I'm not going to just come in and just talk about the one tooth that's broken, that there's going to be <clears throat> a discussion. So she's setting the patient up for that. She's talking about some things from what she knows. And what happens over time with enough of those conversations and a commitment toward those conversations it doesn't mean that every patient is going to do <laughs> what you say, but it creates this awareness. And one of my favorite things to do with patients is just to say, listen, you don't have to do anything here, but I just want you to know what's going on and set you up for what might come in five to 10 years if we do nothing at all here and just let you see and just see if you have any questions about that. And you don't have to do a thing unless you really want to, but I certainly want you to know. And I think yeah. that how, the brass tax side of it is, how do you deal with this <clears throat> when you're setting your hygiene time? How do you deal with this when you're talking about bringing new patients into your practice? Wes already alluded to the fact that we try to see new patients with the doctor first when we can. But as he said, the hardest thing I think is the established patient who you're starting to see problems with in the yeah. hygiene operatory. And I think it starts, Wes, with having enough time for your hygienist in their normal appointment. You yeah, know, let's talk about that for yeah. a minute. You know, if we are, if we look at the average, I looked it up just to see what the pay scale for a current hygienist per hour, it's 3350 per hour. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And of course, obviously that's the average nationwide. Actually, I think I see another stat here in 2017. It was like 35. Let's just say it's 35 bucks an hour. So in an hours, and you know, John, we we could sit here and talk about what they should be producing. They should be producing three three times that amount. Let's just say, right? Right. Okay. So we're at 100 bucks. All right. Let's just call it that. So they produce 100 dollars in one hour, and that essentially is a cleaning. Okay. And maybe. <laughs> Maybe a, an exam, right? Bite you know, wings or fluoride treatment, or bite something wings, like that. It's easy fluoride to push treatment that over it's the easy. top. Yeah, easy to push that over the top. And so, but I think, you, but I think what we're trying if you're to get reimbursed at, though, though, here's the thing: if yeah. you're reimbursed, <clears throat> right, at half, right, of that, then what you have to do is you have to say, nope, you only get thirty minutes per adult patient, right. Or we're going to do assisted hygiene. Right. And all the time you're going to get to do is you're going to get to scale. And so that commodity-based practice is going to have a real hard time. Yep. A real hard time getting to this type of conversation. Yeah, you may have it, a productive it, hygiene department. But, you'll kill it. But you'll in the end, it. you know, what the hygiene department should should make up is roughly... 33% of your overall practice production. And really in most high production practices, it's closer to 25%. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it, you'll, those are the practices that I, I hear about that go, man, my hygienists are just killing it. They're crushing it. We're doing assisted hygiene. You won't believe the number of patients we see. And hygiene is pro the hygiene department is profitable, it's but, amazing. but usually 
the dentist is doing a lot of, you know, class two composites and single crowns, and that's about it. No, not, not it, but you know what I'm saying. And, and the question is, is that the kind of dentistry that you want to be doing? Now, if it is, okay. But if you're hearing this, and I think if you're listening to the show, you're somebody who's, who sees that there's more and you know that there's more and you want to find time to talk to patients, you have to accept, and here's really the thing, you have to accept that oftentimes your time as an education side of things is going to be a loss leader. You're yeah. going to lose money on your exam. You're going to lose money oftentimes on your comprehensive exam, on your periodic exam. Uh, you're not making money on that stuff. And you're sometimes even going to lose money on hygiene for, uh, you know, sometimes days on end because you're going to be in a situation where you have to have these discussions and you run over yeah, so, and you have longer appointments. And, and, it, yeah. and, and the question is, does it work out in the end? And I'm not just talking about, because it's easy to say, yeah, you feel better at the end of the day, but there's a lot of people who are like, oh, well, you know what? We got to make money here. And I would make the case, Wes, that in the end, that's really where your practice can skyrocket is if you just create just a little bit more value in those it's patients' enjoyable eyes. dentistry. Yeah, I don't I don't have arguments with patients or get upset for patients like John said that don't accept treatment. Right. You know, like there's a guy that I saw today and he's so insurance driven, so insurance driven. And he and he's an elderly man, man that has several broken teeth. And he's like, so what are we going to do about those teeth, doc? And um, I said, well, you know. Well, we planned this, you know, and Megan's going to go over the plan. You know, they need cores and crowns. And, and I said, when you're financially comfortable with, you know, fixing those teeth, I'm ready to go forward. Well, well can we, you know, and I'm like, he's still wanting to talk about how he can get out of doing the crowns. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like they try to control the conversation. And yeah. let me just tell you, if you start having the tough conversations, you're going to get rejected yep. time and time again. I had a patient that was a patient for 12 years in my practice. I even placed a dental implant on this guy. He's my age. And he left my practice over insurance last year. Mm. And listen, listen to me. If you're in your first five, 10 years of practice, five years of your practice, in my first 10 years, I would say it'd take me a long time because I'm a filler. That would have rode me to no end. I would have not, I would have had a bad weekend because that patient chose commodity-based <clears throat> dentistry versus what I gave him. Yeah. And I gave him, you all know the type of stuff we give our patients. Right. I gave him the best. Yeah. You know? And so... Will it lead to a lot of rejection? You got to be prepared for that. You do. You know, there was a guy one time, can't remember the guy's name, and he he had this lecture it calls, isn't it great when patients say yes? And I don't remember who it was, but I remember the lecture, and it was really great for me to hear that because he talked about this type of practice where, you know, you're going to have more no's. And his big saying was no, and we've heard this before, you hear it from any kind of speaker, but he was a dentist and he was speaking to me and he said, no, doesn't mean never. It just means not right now. Yeah. And I hold on to that right. even to this day because I can't bear my patient's problems. Right. Okay. I cannot. But I think it. we have to decide, you know, in our, in our practice whether or not um, you're willing to believe in this because yeah, you, you know it is truly that. a faith thing here you know you you hear what we're saying and if it's not currently what you're doing you know you you tend to think you know man it's hard to say well, to my hygienist examples, i'm going to give you an hour to see every patient or more and i'm going to let you kind of dictate that because you know your patients and I'm going to come in and we're going to talk to patients and we're going to ask them to come back for comprehensive exams. And we're going to, you know, tell them that they need to come back and get models and they need to get photographs and they need to have consider mm. comprehensive treatment. And when they say no, we say that's fine. You know, when it fits into your life, then we're ready 
to do something or if you want to learn more or just saying to the patient, you know, I'm seeing some problems here. Um, let me kind of give you the, the 30 second overview. Would you like to know more about this right now? Or would you like mm. to just monitor this as it is now and be just kind of be aware and, and have me update you about it later and just be prepared for that. And those types of things, if you, if you're willing to believe in this, you have to enact a system in your office that actually supports that. It starts with a phone call from the patient. Um, how your front office team explains what the patient's going to experience when they come in. Mm. It goes through, you know, either bringing them in to see you or it starts in the hygiene room with your established patients of how do you start having these conversations with an established patient about things you know now that you didn't know before. And we, we're not going to go into all of that because, you know, you're, you're better off taking those, those courses from people that, that teach this all the time. But we do mm. want you to know it's working in our practices. It's working and it takes time. It's not quick. It's not something you can you can sign up for like a new insurance plan and you start seeing, you know, new people coming in. It's something that really it takes a long time. It takes years. Um, but it but it in the end you find yourself doing more of the dentistry that you really love. I think the biggest thing I can tell listeners right now is that it does take buy in from your team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you'll have a team that if they don't have buy-in regarding this type of practice and your vision for your practice doesn't match your team vision or current vision, then you're going to be in trouble. So that goes without saying, too, that if you're an associate in a practice working for a senior doctor, that you don't you don't have any ownership in the practice. And that associate is driving what you're doing or I'm sorry, that <clears throat> owner is driving what you're doing, meaning their vision for you is different than your, what you're wanting to do. Well, that's not going to work. Okay? Right, right. And, and the second place it won't work is it won't work if you're in a group setting and you have part ownership. So you're going to have to change the vision of the entire partnership. Right. Right? Because unless you can somehow figure out to have some small subset of a practice over here, but that's, that's, I don't know how that would work. Yeah. And then, and then let's say that you're in a situation where you're going to buy out <clears throat> mm -hmm. somebody like you've signed an agreement as an associate and this guy's phasing out, which is a lot of times happening these days. So those are, those are easier in my opinion, because then you can begin to start to press through your vision. Right. And, and when your vision starts to come, start shining through, yeah. what happens is, is that the people on the team that don't line up with your vision, they go bye-bye. And right. that's okay. It becomes you know, because, obvious. You know, like, it becomes again, obvious you know, who's, who's it, with it you does. on that. You've had it happen. I've had it happen. Right. You know? Well, I think and, that and, a couple of things that you can start doing now, if you want to be moving toward this, is... Take a leap of faith mm. and start setting aside a couple of slots in your doctor's schedule for maybe an hour and a half, twice mm. a week, once a week. And when you have a patient, you instruct your front office team. When someone calls this new patient, start come have a sheet that every time every new patient has asked the same questions. And if and, and have on those questions something about what they're why are they calling. Um, are, do they have a bunch of dental problems? You know, if they start telling the stories to your front office team that they've got a lot of problems, that's a doctor patient. Let them come see you. Let your assistant take a full mouth series of x-rays, take some photographs, and sit and treatment plan that patient as if they were your wife or your husband and, yep. and spend time getting to know them. If it's from a hygiene perspective, start talking to your hygienists about you know, how can we have more time to talk to our patients about comprehensive dentistry? Um, and maybe that means changing some timing of your hygiene visits. Maybe that means giving them more flexibility. Maybe that means uh, setting aside uh, exam time during uh, each hygiene visit where the doctor's more available instead of, you know, doing another class two composite. Uh, those are the kind of discussions to have. And, and, you know, you have to be intentional about it. This will not happen by accident and it will not happen just because you went and took more clinical courses. That's the thing I guess that I that I want to get across today with this discussion yeah. is the clinical education has to be there. You can't fake that. You can't fake a full mouth reconstruction that you don't know how to do. 
You can't fake an implant placement, but you can know all the clinical stuff in the world. But if you're not taking the time with patients, you're not making that intentional uh, move in your practice, like Wes said, to have that vision that's shared with your team, you're not going to see the results that you want. You're not going to be doing as much of that dentistry as you want. And over time, if you make that decision, I mean, man, you know, mm. really the sky's the limit. You, you, you can get to Actually, a point. it's kind of like a faucet. Yeah, yeah. And once you kind of see, start seeing it drip, you know, it yeah. starts to actually run a little bit. Yeah. And then it starts to pour. Yeah. And then you know what? All that other hard stuff. I mean, it's still hard. Yeah, it's still hard. It's, a, it's still hard because there's still the battle. But it starts to kind of like, oh, man, because over here now I'm doing this. And so I'm going to go over here in this room. Right. And then you're like, well, I just did the case over well, here. And, so when you're, and when your hygienist knows oh. that the reason you're running behind is because, because you're in there care. talking mm. to that patient about what they really need that day. They don't care. They don't care. I mean, yeah, they don't sure, care. sure, it's stressful sometimes. But, you know, they know that they know you're doing it right. You're doing the right thing. And so in the end, that's all you got to do is just tweak the timing. And realize yep. there's going to be those days sometimes where it's not going to work perfect. But your hygienists start to believe in what you're trying to do. Your front office team, hey, he's running late because there's some there's a really important thing that we're trying to decide what to do with this patient. And believe me, if it's ever something you need that extra time, he's going to take that time with you too. And that's the kind this of is... stuff that we want our... I mean, that's what we want from our physicians, <clears throat> from yeah. our you know auto mechanics, from our trusted people in our life our accountant, our financial planner, whatever, we expect that they're going to customize care for us and they're going to give us the best. So I think we just need to do that for our patients. And it's it's changed my practice for sure over all these years, you know? This is classic dental guys. Yeah. You know, this is so classic. Speaking of classic dental guys, guys, we yeah, have Geek's Corner time, John. Geek's Corner <laughs> is coming back at you. And if you yeah. checked... Our Facebook uh, feed this last oh couple of weeks um, in February, January, February, I posted a little uh, kind of cutout snippet mm. of an article that came from the International Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Implants, and it was entitled, "Really, this is a super geeky title, Resonance Frequency Analysis Agreement and Correlation of Implant Stability Quotients between three commercially available instruments. And that's one of those titles that you're just like, la, 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 <laughs> you know, because it's like, what is going on here? What is going on? So let's on? break it down. We've talked a little bit on the show, but not a lot, Wes. We've talked a little bit yeah. about implant stability quotient. And, and Wes, talk a little bit about what is implant stability quotient, ISQ. Talk a little bit about the devices that are available now versus the ones that were available before, and then we'll get into this mm -hmm. article a little bit. So implant stability quotient is a standardized measurement of what we call resonance frequency analysis. <clears throat> Essentially, this is for dental implant therapy to evaluate the stability of a dental implant during placement and after placement and <clears throat> as healing progresses. It's been around since the early mid '90s. It was invented by um, you, we all know by a group of scientists out of uh, Sweden, and uh, they came up with a unit called the Ostel unit. The Ostel unit measures implant stability quotient, and it gives you a quantifiable range of numbers. It gives you a number that we can apply to um, how stable the, and we can actually apply to our clinical practice and use that to make decisions on when to load it, if it's stable enough to do certain things, okay? Yeah. Let's just keep it at that. So, um, a few years ago, um, a group of scientists that created Austel left and started another company called Integrated Diagnostics. Actually went right across the street, and they invented a, a machine that measures implant stability quotient, called the penguin. And um, the difference between the penguin and the Ostel unit is that the Ostel unit, the price of the, the components, we won't go into that, 
were just, it's impossible to incorporate that into a practical based uh, dental practice, meaning outside of education, it was, well, just impossible, too expensive. Yep. It was used only by the researchers. Now we're talking about something that's been around since 96. <clears throat> There's 500, 600 papers written around this as a validated way of measuring stability. So yep. we know that. The the company that came up with the Penguin to com, uh, to be a competitor product to the Austel, well, they came up with a way to do it more in a practical setting. In a day-to-day practice now, for, for dollars, we can measure um, resident frequency analysis and get this quotient. And well, it's only a dollar or so per use yeah, for the new for the new uh, uh, unit versus the older one. And so yeah. the question is, well, well, is it validated? Is it validated? Number one, and and we know that the Ostel has been validated because it's been around forever. It's been kind of the standardized unit. But we did wonder a little bit about um, the Penguin because it was a newer uh, of device and we we've been using the penguin for a little while we had no reason to think that it wasn't validated i mean this is definitely an, an approved device for use but mm-hmm. this is a first study and it's done by michael norton who we all well hey stop right there man yeah we yeah. love michael norton yeah we love michael yeah. norton and and you know i love because every time he publishes something it's just him it's not like <laughs> Mike norton he doesn't work at with all. anybody it's else like it's all just him <laughs> And uh, and so what he did, he did this study comparing uh, the the different devices. So he uh, had 210 implants, and he was uh, measuring both at placement and restoration, and a few of them uh, mm-hmm. were were had both measures uh, placed. And he used the same implant, same manufacturer, and take took a ton of measurements. And so a total of uh, 1,260 measurements is what he took. Mm-hmm. And you know that's a that's a lot of measurements. That's a lot of uh, of of data points. And what he was comparing is he compared the three devices and wanted to know did they agree among themselves and did they have repeatability. You said three, and let's let's clarify. Mm-hmm. The ping one is one. Yep. The the original Austel unit. Yep. And the newest Austel unit, right, John? Right, right. The newest Austel is more simplified. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's, well, um, I should say it this way. It has some interesting features. It's got some cloud storage of data, which is kind of cool, um, versus just an individual measurement. The penguin is, is just an individual measurement one time kind of thing. And then one of the Ostel units has got, you know, you can store data in the cloud. You can get historical measurements and memory basically. And then the, uh, the more simplistic Ostel just has a memory setting, but doesn't have any cloud storage. So they, there's some fancier and some non-fancy. The Penguin is definitely not a fancy, fancy. It's a very basic instrument compared to some of the others. But the real question was, w- did they agree? And how closely did they agree? And what he found is that the two Ostel units agreed really, really the closest between each other. They were, they were the closest, but did find some interesting error in one of the Ostel uh, units in the buccal lingual direction. So that was just kind of interesting that uh, he found that this one uh, particular unit just didn't always give him the same as the other two units uh, in, in just that one uh, uh, in that one direction. And that was the um, Ostel IDX, which is the newest Ostel. And he said 1.75% of the time in this study, um, he had this these false negative low readings. So that was kind of interesting. But biggest thing I took from this was that although the two Ostel units agreed the closest, the Penguin and the Ostels were close, very close in the end. And he the conclusion was the variation was an upper limit of about one it was 1.8 to 86 units which where he so he says it is statistically significant but it's a it's of questionable clinical relevance so the bottom line is they're close enough within a measurement of two units that really you you would have no problem comparing the the measurements within a pretty close uh range to each other and considering the fact that certainly the penguin is more cost-effective, not only to buy the unit, but also more cost-effective in the use of the pegs. 
it, it made us feel like this was a good unit to be looking at. Not that the Ostel's bad. Ostel's great, you know? Yeah, you can, yeah Ostel's fantastic. You know, yeah. the cost of these units, you know, Ostel's around five grand or so, and I think the Penguin's like 2000 or something like right. that. But the problem is, is that the Ostel um, transducers, these yep. are the, the smart peg. pegs, smart pegs, the Ostel units are single use only. Yep. Well, they are hundred bucks. Right. So and it's they're like, also what? a lot bigger. And he made a comment about yeah. that. He said, you know, that He's, the Ostel was pain. Yeah, a little bit more painful for the patient because it's bigger and bulkier. It didn't yeah. always fit completely within the platform of the implant, whereas the smart peg did. So he kind of yep. liked that that feature, and I like that feature too. Um, yeah. so, so that was kind of cool. And I yeah, think the, you know the, what the butt's the bottom line here is that if you are considering this technology, it's it, you should it's look awesome. at the Penguin and feel good about it, and look at the Ostel too. You know they're both good units, uh, but definitely from a cost standpoint, day to day, you know nothing right now beats the Penguin, and it gives you some really important data. I know Wes and I have been using this for a while now. And we're yeah, testing every year. Yeah, we're testing every implant we place and every implant we restore. And it's great to have this, as as the advertising says, it removes doubt, you know, and it's really true because I feel so much better about going to restorative or whether I need to go to a healing abutment or a cover mm -hmm. screw um, based on my ISQ. Doesn't mean ISQ is everything. You know, we still mm -hmm. have to look at torque and we still have to look at clinical things and so how the surgery yeah. go. It's not uh, one size fits all, but it certainly gives you some valid measurement for repeatability. And I just love the idea too. If an implant comes in from another office and I'm not sure about it, I can throw a peg on there and I can measure it. And I can at least, if there's a if there's a bad measurement, right off the bat, I can I can make some judgments on that that are that are really really nice. So check it out and check that article out in uh, Jomi. It's in this month's uh, issue. So Wes, let's let's Love answer it. some questions from uh, well, one of our one of our longtime listeners uh, sent us this question or this comment a while back, and and we really we talked a lot about it, you know we kind of hesitated at first to answer it because it's a pretty heavy duty question and it has to I feel do like I could with write a book on that yeah on the yeah and so I want to um, let me read the question and Wes I want you to kind of start the discussion about uh you know your thoughts on it um so the question is and this is really the the nitty-gritty of it is this first sentence is airway too much out on the fringe to be brought in into an evidence-based practice and it goes on i'm just going to read a couple couple parts of it um should we address airway with proper referrals to ortho ent then proceed as normal and he's referring to, to when we were interviewed dr rebecca bacow uh, Dr. Bacow says, do no harm, insinuating not going along with proposed recommendations are harm. However, we can't go past what is consented. What are the guidelines for expansion? Two millimeters, three millimeters until symptoms are resolved? Which symptoms? It seems that sleep is more evidence-based as far as predictable intervention goes. Um, so I think that the, the real question, Wes, that I want to drill into here from that is, is airway too much on the fringe to be implemented? And Let's first talk about, is it on the fringe? And then second, let's talk a little bit about implementation because you mm. and I are kind of in different places with this in our practice. Even though we've done a lot of the same training, um, we, we're definitely in different places with it. And so what do you think about it? Is it too fringe? Well, no, it's not <laughs> too fringe. And I mean, medicine acknowledges, I mean, for goodness sakes, we have... Um, people that are being treated with CPAP. And so um, it's not too fringe. It's, it's, it's validated that people do have airway problems, uh, whether it be sleep apnea or upper airway resistance syndrome or whatever it is. Right. It is but a But what about the treatment, Wes? The so, dental treatment so, and expansion and right. surgery. So what we're talking about, John, is we're talking about is airway to fringe to be brought into a dental practice. And again, I am a believer in a big way. Okay. And I'll tell you what I tell my patients. Okay. Again, this is one of those things that goes back to this first conversation we had about having a practice where you can talk to people is that 60 to 70% of the time when I would make an occlusal guard, okay, I would find success. Mm -hmm. 
30 to 40 percent of the time, I would find some success, but limited yeah. to the point of frustration. Yeah. Okay. The interesting thing as uh, as two to three years has passed since your and I journey into occlusion, sleep, is that the patients that struggled the most um, in wearing an occlusal guard had some form of apnea. And to the point of that when I look at them now, I understand so much because I've spent so much time with sleep physicians. I've spent so much time with pulmonologists other dentists that are practicing in exclusive sleep practices, I look at these patients now and I say, duh, Wes. Like, duh, this patient has sleep apnea. And, you know, John and I said this when we came back. We said, does everybody have sleep apnea? Now, the reason why we said that is because here we are all along not knowing what we know now. Right. And we are aware of the concerns and we are aware of what our colleagues in medicine now have been seeing for years. What we're aware of now that's linked to apnea is the dental condition, okay? The dental conditions that you see on a day-to-day basis that go along with apnea are high-vaulted palates, frostbites. When I, I just incorporated, a, a, I've incorporated a lot, but just one of the things that I've incorporated into my comprehensive exam is looking at the throat, Okay, and I've been doing this for now two years in my exam, classifying patients on what kind of tonsil score they have and what their uvula looks like and what their pharynx look like. And I really have been studying what tonsillar pillars should look like. And when you just acknowledge the anatomy and you start to understand growth patterns and what happened to a patient, and then you question them about their medical history everything starts to line up. Right. And so the knowledge supports the clinical-based practice. So it's not too fringe. It fits. And whenever we treat patients, we treat them with a medical-based um, consent from physicians. Well, okay? I, think what's, I think what's hard, though, because I, I, I completely agree with you, but I think what's hard, and maybe, agree, and, and maybe what he's getting, what'd you say? I don't want you to agree sometimes. Well, no, that part I agree with. But what I do think is a little fringe, I'm just going to say it. I think that what he's getting at is not necessarily that airway as a whole, as we understand it being, you know, do people have apnea? Of course. Do they have upper airway problems? Can we see that in the mouth? Definitely. Does it create problems with bruxism or does it create problems with, you know, their life in general and whatever? We know that. Bring it, John. I'm ready for the answer on this. But I think that what he's getting at (laughs) is the huge hole that we have in our understanding is the intervention, okay? Because we know that, say, surgery helps, right? So we were just talking about this at our Airway Study Club a month or two ago about orthognathic surgery, right? We know mm. that we know that orthognathic surgery can help people with apnea. It but but here's the big thing. Who who needs it? How much do you move? How far do you move? How much do you expand? Do you do you have to move both jaws? Um what what about tad expansion? How far do you have to expand? How far forward? How far to the side? We understand some of these things in terms of, okay, you do this and people get better. But I think what's hard is how much of some of these things do you do? And how do you communicate that to a surgeon? Or how do you communicate that to an ENT in a way that you can say is evidence-based? That I think is a challenge. I think what you're referring to not necessarily is fringe, but I think what you're referring to is resolutions, mm-hmm. okay? Yeah. So there's a difference between control points right. in apnea and resolutions. So the extreme, okay, is that I control somebody with a CPAP or a mandibular advancement device, and even some ways I control people with um, mutes and mouth taping right, and right. myofunctional therapy. So I've controlled them, but the question is, Okay, 
past the control, are we ready to offer resolution? Right. Okay. And where does that fit inside of a practice right now in America? Because I will say that that is a discussion that is meant for a roundtable discussed with people that are way smarter than I am. And as John and I have surrounded ourselves with a study club, <clears throat> we are beginning to dissect the protocols right. that go into making decisions for patients to create resolution. Because the sickest person there is a person that I saw at a surgeon's office that the surgeon, you know him well, um, and saw and said, Wes, the guy cannot sit down in a chair and lay his head back. He cannot tolerate CPAP. And so therefore, orthognathic surgery was performed, and now the guy immediately lost 50 pounds without exercise. He immediately can lay his head on his pillow and breathe. He immediately is decreases apnea hypopnea index. So there is some resolution that some people have been achieving. The question is, is what are the protocols for that? And right. that's the question that John and I have. Right. I will say that control points are what most people will choose today. Right. Most patients do not want to resolve this. For instance, I'll use my wife. She doesn't mind. Okay. Yeah, Laura. All right. So she's probably going to listen to this and think, what are you doing? No struggles to wear a splint, struggles to wear a retainer, frustrating to know in. I'll go get the five different appliances that have been made for her by me and two other doctors that she could never wear, even a mandibular advancement device in my early on days of practicing like that. But once I understood where the anatomy problems were, with dilation of the nose and proper nasal breathing re-education, Headaches go away, clenching goes away, snoring goes away. But here's the thing. Laura, I understand that you don't want to do those things at night every night. So what's the resolution for Laura? Well, it's a trip to the ENT and a septal deviation repair, turbinate reduction, and surgery and downtime away from her family. Some of the easiest cases are those that are treated on the low end. And those are the simple, quick cookbook cookie cutter. Right. The things that we see from people like Jeff Rausch and people like Rebecca Bacow and people like um, the surgeon that we saw at Spear Summit, those people are practicing at the very highest end. And so that means it's fringe. Does it mean it's unproven? No, because Gimeno has been doing this at the university's setting in a large way for many years, and he's frustrated when he gets on the podium and he says, and he hears doubt. Well, I, but, and, but again, I think the counterpoint, I have to bring it back to this. I, I'm not saying that these people aren't practicing at a high level, but honestly, I don't think they always know what result they're going to get. I think when they're talking about I, resolution, okay, when right. you say, you say, all right, uh, this patient, like you, you, the example you gave is obviously very, very extreme, right? The patient who can't right. even lay their head back, right? But you, you know, get your CPAP patient who's you know relatively moderate, mild to moderate apnea patient who's not severely overweight, who can pretty much function, but you're looking at a narrow palate, right? And you go, okay, I think that the, the problem is is that we got a narrow palate here and we've got mm -hmm. to expand that palate. Uh, or we've got to, we got a it's a class two patient. We need to advance the mandible or maybe that will help. The question to me, and I think where these people still don't really know if they can, is how far do you advance? How far do you expand? There's, there's not, there's limited data. Well, there's there. limited protocols, but I don't think that it's not being done. Oh, I agree, it's being done, and I think with sometimes great success. But I would say, and I would where love it... to have Jeff on and say, okay, so you tell me. What do you say? Because I, I took his seminar just a couple months ago, and I love to see the cases where he has a resolution and it works amazing, and I and I want I love it. Okay, but how? What do you? What does he tell the orthodontist and the surgeon? Like, right. I need you to expand how much? I need you to go because when we're talking about facially generated treatment planning, we know all the answers. We can say we know where the teeth need to go. We know the aesthetic demands. We know the occlusion. We understand how to set it all up. But when we're talking about airway 
and we're saying we want to resolve it through, say, surgery or expansion, um, we're guessing. So the whole idea behind Seattle Protocol is that you don't have to guess. Well, you do when you're talking you, about surgery, though. When you are talking about surgery, that's you what expand. I'm talking about is surgery or expansion. I mean, if you say you can, you can so, test a splint, you can test an advancement device. Definitely, you can test, right. you know, nasal surgery to some extent with dilators. I agree with that. But when you're talking about like orthognathic surgery or expansion of a palate, there's really no way to test that. You don't know if it's going to resolve it until you actually do the surgery. I think there's more data than. Um, than has yet to be published. I think that I think people are doing it. I think you're right. I, I think, think people are doing out it. There. I think that we, as dentists, at this point in time, have we almost it almost has to be like an oral cancer screening. That's what I've kind of mm -hmm. how I'm kind of putting it towards my residents is that. I'm teaching it what it looks like, what it, what are some concerns. Yeah, you need to biopsy this, you know, and right. you need diagnostics to further assess. And, and it doesn't have to be in your practice. In fact, most of the time it's not. And, and you don't have to know how to treat it because the reason why John and I incorporated sleep into our practice is to stop our stuff from being destroyed right. and prevent it and right. know why a patient got there. So the Parkinson patient that he was talking about, we know why they got there. Right. But why did this patient get to the place that they're at? So I agree um, that the guidelines right now are not published, as Rebecca would say, but they are being they're being they're being worked out. I think they are too. Um, I think they are and, too. I and think I think that you have to kind of almost stay tuned. Yeah. But here here's the here's the biggest problem that I've got right now with all this. Okay. I, I, I'm I, I'm been a little bit here. Is I have a problem with not offering resolution. I I do, and I have a problem with having a blanketed approach to this. I I, I thought that I wouldn't, but I, I can't do it. I can't just blanket everybody with one regimen because mm -hmm. medicine has done that. Yeah. Okay. Medicine actually said CPAP is our, is our cure all. And look what's happened is that the compliance is terrible. And mandibular advancement device is the same way you can't just say, this is it. This right. is how you fix it. You actually just have to do a few things to understand anatomy and you start seeing what could be done to possibly fix it. Right. And, and really where it all comes full circle for me in a big way is the kids and the young, the youngest kids really and intervening early. And so I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah. I'm I mean, it's definitely coming it. along. I think that but, we're just, you know, I'm just a little impatient about it because I feel like we we hear a lot about the resolutions because those are the big exciting things. And I mean, I'm right in the middle of a case with one of my patients where yeah. we're going to be doing surgery because this patient needs it and I know he needs it. But but when I tell my surgeon or when the orthodontist, I mean, I asked the orthodontist the other day, so how are you going to do the model surgery? I was mm -hmm. like, because how do we determine the orthognathic? Well, we have to do model surgery. We have to tell the surgeon where to put the jaw. How do we determine that? He's like, well... We're going to just go as far forward as we think we can and get a reasonable aesthetic result. And I was like, well, that's not satisfying to me. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I right. think that's all we really know right now. We can't say it's X millimeters. We can't say, no. we can't calculate a volume and say this well, is what the patient I needs. I said this, I said this before, and, and the problem that we have as dentists is that we have quantified the heck out of a class two composite yep. and how to fix it and how to fix somebody's tooth. Like there's only less... Mr. Haley has said, there's five things you can do to a tooth, West Mullins. Right, right. And and we've quantified the heck out of it because we have a millimeter probe and we like to measure. Yeah, yeah. The interesting thing here with, with medicine is that you cannot quantify a lot of medical improvement. It's, um, it's impossible. Right. It's impossible. That's why they have these quality of life indicators. Right. You know, because really you ask the question here, Anthony, is that, 
which, what do we do until XY symptoms are resolved? Which symptoms? Great question, right? Because if I get in medicine 80 to 90% or even sometimes 50% of my symptoms to go away, then the patient accepts that as success. Right. Okay? And, and, and is that okay? Yes, that is totally fine. And here's the problem with the dentist. They can't handle that. They can't handle the fact that the AHI won't drop below that five. Right. They can't handle it. Well, and, and so, so I think the, that that's where that's I, where is that we're, valid? Is that valid? And I think that's where we we have a ways to grow. You know, because yeah, you're we right. Do. We have to we have to be okay with that. But I guess I guess yeah, we still have to have some protocol, some place where we can say, again, you going into surgery, you just got to have some idea where you're going. And I you think right have now something. we're still struggling with that a little bit. And I love the fact that. We're struggling with it because it gives us something to learn. It gives us something to to keep plugging into and and listening to these people who are smarter than we are, who can tell us here is what works. Because that's we're like at kind of an exciting point because they're actually developing protocols right now, and we're going to getting to see that get rolled out and and being a part of that uh, is really awesome. So, well, Wes, I think it was a great question. We didn't really get too much implementation. <laughs> we'll have to talk about that another show. No. But I think it helps to start fleshing out, you know, kind of where we are with our understanding of this right now. And that it's it's not easy. It's something you really you gotta can tell dig, we're we're dig we into. both Yeah, we're both digging in. We're both have really I mean, we both believe in it and we both are using the knowledge we have. And it's difficult because again, medicine is different than dentistry. Yep. I'm gonna say that. And it is truly different. And if you're not ready for that, then you got to be. You you just need to you just need to recognize it as oral cancer screening. Yeah. And then and recognize that. And that's okay. If I could just get everybody to just recognize that, you would save so many lives. Yeah. It's like checking blood pressures. Well, so if if you've if you've enjoyed this discussion, we hope that you will give us some feedback about that. You know, we had I think some really good stuff today, Wes, talking about you know how to change your practice how to take uh, you know, to the next level the idea of what spending time educating your patients, creating relationships does. we got some good Geeks Corner stuff in there and then some good discussion about airway. Um, we want you to connect with our social media channels today. If you liked this show or you have comments, you want to hear more about certain things, you disagree with us totally, we love it. Get on Facebook, get on Instagram, get on Twitter. And tell us what you think. Tell us what you like, what you don't like, questions you have, things you want to hear more about. Uh, post your pictures up of cool cases if you want us to look at them and see what you're up to. We just had somebody post a cool picture today of a composite warmer that we uh, kind of recommended a few that. shows back, saying that they got it and they loved it. So that's pretty awesome. We want you to definitely leave us some reviews on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast listening uh, service you use, like Stitcher or whatever you're using so that we can uh, be at the top of the ratings and people can discover us. Because the dental podcast uh, world is definitely getting more and more crowded, and we know you guys love what we're doing, so we just want to make sure that other people get to learn about us. So tell other people if you like what we're doing. Uh, we're excited uh, for the next few weeks. We're going to be at a couple different big meetings. American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics, Chicago Midwinter, Academy of Austin Integration, the Hinman meeting, that is just all in the next month. So we will be bringing you some pretty exciting content coming up in these oh, next son. couple of months. It's going to be good stuff, and we know you'll be tuning in and talk more with us. And for Wes, I'm John, and we are the Dental Guys.